record. All right, uh, let's start from the very beginning. Again, officially welcome MED 110 5DAX, Tuesday mornings, 9 a.m. Uh, week four, November 2. Next week, November 9 is our midterm and we will be on campus. For those of you who already informed me um, um, that you cannot be on campus next week, you already have my response and uh, follow those instructions so that uh, you can take your midterm and also, um, so how, uh, how is that going to go down next week? Well, I will have uh, information on where exactly is the class in announcements and here for recording purposes, the class is held in Health Lab 1 on the fourth floor Alexandria campus. Um, please get there just a little bit early because there are instructions uh, um, where your mask on at all times. Uh, and um, after the exam, uh, you, have the, um, you have the option to go home, but if some of you wanna start your laboratory early, um, by all means, uh, yeah, I, we'll take a little 15 minute break. And if you want, guys wanna do some dissection, uh, I'll gladly break out the, um, uh, the pig parts and uh, we, can, uh, we can do a little, uh, a little session. Um, uh, make sure not to bring a lot of things, personal items, uh, because uh, we, we want to limit the amount of exposure as much as possible. So that's for next week. Now, what is the scope of the exam? It is anything that we discussed lecture-wise and or uh, even um, your, there could be cases on, on uh, there'll be some on your uh, lessons or your cases, but the, but the questions will be related to the content week one through four. So everything, every lecture that we've gone through uh, from day one up to, up to and including today, and it'll be 50 items, multiple choice. Later on this afternoon, I'll be putting announcements, an actual exam that I, um, uh, that I gave to a, a class before you. It won't be the same exam that you'll be taking, but it'll be similar content, similar style. Now, please do not ask me for the key. That's your responsibility to try to look up, uh, look up the answers. And also the main part is to look at the flavor of the exam, look at the content. Uh, and it'll uh, lead you to, you know, what's important and how do I ask questions. But every time, you know, in my lecture, when I ask questions like, um, uh, you know, um, like, oh, this sounds like a good question. That's, that's a major hint, hint, because odds are it probably is a question on my midterm, uh, midterm and or final. So for next week, please do not do the only thing that you will be doing for next week is um, uh, your task four. I repeat, the only thing due for next week is task four, okay? Do not do discussion four. Do not do the case study in lesson four. And I know I'm repeating myself, but there's always one person who asks or does the discussion uh, and if you did the discussion and did the lesson in advance, I can apply, uh, if you did it already, don't worry about it. I can apply to uh, some sort of extra credit, but please going forward, and there's timestamps to it, please do not do discussion four and lesson four. The only thing do is for next week, November 9th by 9 a.m. is task four. Now, the next thing that I need to talk about is uh, both your tasks and your discussions. We are in healthcare. It is integral that you follow directions. And the directions were clearly stated on your tasks that do not write them physically, write them down. And I answered to some people, oh, I'm not good at computers or my computer's acting funny. That is, I'm sorry, but for lack of a better term, it's an excuse. Find a way, get another computer, go to the campus, the library is open, use our computers, okay? So that, and also if you're not good at computers, give me a call so that you can get better at it because you need to, you need to know how to do these concept maps electronically. Uh, some of you tried to be clever and took a picture of it and then put it in a Microsoft Word document as if I'm not gonna open it please don't do that because that will just 
tick somebody off. Uh, and I'll be honest, it ticked me off a little bit because come on, I gave clear instructions on what to do. Some of you also stated that, and, um, and not only for this class, but the other classes, that, oh, my Microsoft, I don't have Microsoft Word. But uh, remember, you as a student have Microsoft Word, uh, uh, Microsoft 365 uh, free. So if you go up here into Student, General How-To Guides, you click on that, and then you go down here to Office 365, and how to access, uh, you know, um, it should pop out here, here you go. And it'll pop out here with screenshots to tell you exactly how to load it onto your computer. And again, you know, this is the modern times. If your computer cannot handle these things that it's asking of you, um, you gotta bite the bullet and get access somewhere um, uh, and or make the investment. And I know it's expensive. I just bought a new computer for my wife and for my son, but it's like one of those things like saying, it's like walking into a classroom saying, oh, I don't have a pen, you know, uh, or my pen doesn't work. Um, uh, remember, I run by the adage two is one, one is none. So for right now, I'm on my computer. I've got. Excuse Hello? me, sir. Do you mind going back for the steps to download the Microsoft Word on sure. the. Sure, I can go back to. So if you want to go uh, download your uh, Microsoft 365, you click up here on the top of your Moodle under student, then hit general or click left click how to guides. Then you go to Office 365 and then all of the uh, screenshots should appear here. And then it'll, uh, um, it, it tells you exactly, uh, you know, how to do it takes a minute to load right and it tells you the uh, the screenshots on exactly how to do it and i'm not going to go into here but every stratford student if you have um your credentials for your um official stratford email and please use your official stratford email for all correspondence with your professors and the university the typical gmail and yahoo every once in a while every 10 emails or so for whatever reason, it goes to our uh, spam and garbage folders. And also, um, a lot of the viruses that were introduced into the university in the last couple of years was from student private emails. So please um, uh, use your um, official Stratford email and check your official Stratford email regularly. I will also be getting, if you're one of my advisees, it is now the beginning of week four. Next week, registration gets o gets opened up. So I will be uh, sending out messages on uh, things that actually you should be looking at. Um, uh, if you have a hold from, you know, the registrar or admissions or uh, financial aid, uh, you won't be able to register. So I'll be getting out those emails. So please pay attention to check your emails every day. Uh, your official Stratford email, and of course, check my announcements as well, because uh, let's say, for example, something, um, you know, unexpected happened. Um, I get into an auto accident or my car breaks down or um, what happened uh, uh, last year, uh, flooding on campus. You know, it's been, uh, there's been a lot of flooding, uh, flood warning advisories of late. Um, for whatever reason, it sometimes floods the first floor and, um, you know, Look again back to look at your announcements. There's a lot of things there. And also, I've noticed also in my other classes as well, some of you guys kind of watch the videos or partially watch the videos. When you watch a video, I know it's boring. It's not like watching Netflix or watching something interesting, but watch like every two minutes, take down notes, um, actually digest what's going on. Uh, because you need that information. And there's a reason why we put up videos and and we put up things to um, to not only amplify, you know, your OpenStax tech book, but, you know, to get this stuff, the more times you see things, the more times you get it into your long term memory. And that's uh, and that's the uh, important part. Yes. Question. OK, this is Amelia. Um, just a quick question. I did um, um, do the Office 360 from from my student email. Do watch it just show. I do have it on my, and I do have it, uh, 
MacBook Pro, but it's not letting me, like when you go, you, you show us to us to go insert and insert shapes. When I go to insert, I don't have no shapes. I only have symbol. So insert symbols or, uh, so I'm opening up and a blank the symbol document. Is like, I'm sorry, the symbol is like a heart, smile, like a little thing. Like, so when I go to insert, I have a table and then I have symbols. I don't have shapes. I don't have draw. Okay, so, so then you can go online, right? And it goes and find other ways like uh, Lucid Chart. There's there's a million and two options if you're Microsoft Word. And also check into your Microsoft Word. If you go into uh, up here Windows or Word, you check to see if uh, like, especially in preferences and things like that, check to see if you have the latest edition downloaded onto your computer. And because sometimes the latest edition, if your computer is a little bit older, it doesn't download uh, and you got to download it manually. I have that issue with my daughter's uh, uh, Microsoft 365 when she had her old PC. Uh, it would give the old version. But uh, tip, we'll talk about that offline, uh, like okay. uh, after the class, so we can share screens so I can show you other ways. Remember, there's other ways. There's always another way to to get the the task and and the discussion out uh, to your professor. Because at the end of the day, it goes all it goes. All I do is I look to see did you do it and did you do it on time. And if you didn't do it, do it to the uh, to the specifications. Because um, I, I can tell you right. I goes those of you who already work in healthcare. Um, uh, do you think uh, your problem with your kids or your problem with your computer or uh, technical difficulties, do you think your boss buys that in the real world? No, they won't. And uh, me, I do because I'm your teacher, but I can tell you right now, many of your other teachers, they'll just give you a zero. They won't answer. They, they'll just say you didn't follow directions and then they'll move on with their day, especially in your 200, 300 level courses. They assume that you already know what you're doing. And uh, so please get this thing hammered out. And for those of you who need some technical help, we're gonna, um, I'll, stay, uh, I'll stay after the lecture and then we could share screens and show some different ways and different options on how to get, um, how to get these tasks out. And also, here's, a, here's another thing. We're, there's what, six of you here, six, right? Um, there's supposed to be like nine in the class. Uh, four of you did all your homework last night. You guys had a week. Right. Don't be that person to do the homework the night before or the night that it's due. Don't like like, uh, like for example, I have items due uh, for my course uh, for my class on Sunday. When do you think I hit that stuff? I hit it when this morning. Why? Because things happen and also have a schedule. You made a considerable financial investment in your education. Right. I can tell you right now, those of you who have good memories. It'll hold maybe for this class, maybe for another 100 level class. But I am telling you, because if you don't get your discipline down and your time management down, it's going to be of considerable issue in your uh, later courses. And I am not exaggerating when I tell you, I have something like uh, around 90 advisees, 40 of you are not even making the minimum standard of the university, let alone the required 3.00 GPA of nursing. I, guess who has the biggest list on, it goes, on students who are in academic trouble? It's the school of nursing. Goes, guess who's also in now in academic trouble uh, with the board of nursing? School of nursing, right? And it's because of li these little things, trying to get this task out in time, discussions and uh, uh, citations and actually um, which brings me to this next part. When I make a comment on discussions, right, kindly reply or, or get to me because it's already now a week, uh, it's already now week four. You've already had three opportunities for discussions. And there are several of you who I keep on saying the same thing. This is not an APA format. This is not, in, and again, if you don't know what that is, hang out until, until the end or shoot me an email. And so I can get you um, the video from uh, from Ms. DeLeon, because some of you didn't have me for uh, uh, medical terminology. You go up here in the library and click on here, APA resources on how to properly cite, because what a discussion is, is a mini paper when you think about it. 
It's a short 250 to 350 word mini paper. And uh, it sets you up on how to properly write. And, uh, and that is a big, big skill set. And if you don't think you write all day, every day in healthcare, you write and write memos and, and charting uh, all day, every day in healthcare. And especially if you're clinical staff, nursing or medicine, that's all you do. That's the majority of my day when I was a physician, just writing. And so it is in your best interest to get good at writing. And another opportunity to get good at writing is of course your lessons when you analyze case studies. And, uh, but I believe overall the case studies are good, but the tasks and discussions, you guys are getting a little bit better, but uh, again, uh, please look at the comments. Uh, please look at the comments that I leave you. How do you know you have comments? How do you know that um, students are answering back your post? Do you see here this little bell up at the top? Make sure, because anytime you see a red number there that you click on it and then uh, it tells you things, right? And if you look, a lot of you, it goes uh, submitted within the last 24 hours, the day before something's due, right? Please don't be that person. Uh, because uh, again, when you submit early, it buys you a lot of things. It buys you time. It buys you time to actually digest what you wrote. And also here too, as well, look out for your messaging. Um, I sometimes message students here, but typically when I message, I, uh, uh, I message back and I email back. So please, 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 if you need help, shoot an email to me. My contact information is up here. Uh, if you need tutoring, if you need help, because um, uh, typically it goes, if you do do it the way that uh, myself and Ms. DeLeon, our librarian uh, showed you how to do discussions, you'll never have any problems with discussions. And uh, right now, uh, my discussions in graduate school, they're anywhere from 800 to 1,000 words. There are three posts per week, uh, if ever you guys wanna to go to graduate school, which I hope you do. Uh, if you wanna have a real career, undergraduate is just the beginning. Now, just imagine if I didn't have, um, uh, what do you call that, time management? And uh, I didn't have the discipline to do things early. Uh, man, the weeks that I don't do things early, it catches up to you real fast. Uh, I, have, I have a 20 page paper due on Sunday. When did I do the outline? I did it two weeks ago. Why? Because I saw it on the syllabus. And now that I have more instructions, now I added onto that, now I could start writing. And it's 20 pages not including uh, works cited and not including the introduction. So let's say, for example, I got 20 pages due in the next five days. So every day I better be writing four to five pages so that by the time I submit, it's due midnight and Sunday, just, just like uh, many of your online classes, right? Um, by Sunday noon, I should be done. And then it buys me an extra 12 hours just in case, you know, something goes bad. And that's time management. And if those of you are like, well, you don't have kids. I have six children. Well, it goes, you don't have a job. I not only have this job, I also teach for George Mason University and, I, and I'm, an, I'm a private business owner as well. So I work seven days a week and I have 80 hour, 90 hour work weeks. So I feel all of you, I, I know how it feels. And now that my kids are home, uh, I have the door shut, but it's mayhem behind that door. And I go to craziness after this lecture because uh, I'm sure they haven't eaten breakfast yet. I feel you, but you gotta, um, you gotta get your time management down. That's my, that's my whole thing. So only task four for next week. So what are we doing this week? Well, we're continuing cellular biology and DNA and we, I guess we need to look at, uh, we already know that DNA is what? What is DNA compared, uh, uh, based on my lecture? my previous lecture, anybody. You could put it on the chat, you could uh, unmute yourself. Uh, what was the, the analogy that I made what DNA is for us? What does it do for us? Why is it so important? Mm -hmm. DNA is our uh, genetic library on our cells. All right, wonderful. That's a, uh, that's a uh, wonderful, thank you, sir. That is a wonderful definition. It's a library and what's in the library? Information. And what information? 
And the answer, all of the above, everything. So you want to know uh, what color your eyes, uh, your kids are going to be. It's there. They want to know uh, what are the odds of you being an alcoholic? Yeah, it's there. What are the odds that you're probably going to uh, be a rock star? It's there. All of it's there. And uh, it has to be tightly packed. And does anyone recall how does it tightly pack itself? Anybody remember a little tidbit from last week's lecture? How does DNA fold itself where other things like proteins can't fold itself? What was the one, let me be a little bit more specific. What was the one uh, bond that, 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 uh, that uh, allows us to do that? Mr. Bolskert, let somebody else answer. Let's see, let, because I got a feeling you know what it is, sir. But anybody else, Ms. Guzman, Ms. Kiala, Ms. Ba, anybody? Ms. Denibe, anybody? Because what, what, what is that one bond that allows the DNA to fold itself so compactly that the entire library, I like that, Mr. Bozkert, I'll, I'll uh, probably use that in future. The library of who you are gets folded. Is it the covalent bond? Is it the non-covalent bond? Is it the uh, ionic bonds? Which bond is it? Right? It's the H bond. Hydrogen bond. So the hydrogen bond, remember, it's one of the weakest out of the bonds that we talked about. So that's another thing we're going to be talking about. It's the DNA structure and how it folds. We're also going to be talking about how do we make more of it? Because remember uh, all that chromatin, we have to copy it. Therefore, I got to make more of it. And also, we know that cells have to grow. And if a cell grows, we have to double up the DNA so that the new cell knows what to do, knows how to read the library, okay? Knows how to read, and the term that I used in my lecture uh, from your textbook is the blueprint of who you are. So let's go into our OpenStax and then talk about, and there's a lovely video uh, I'm gonna show you in a bit. Let us talk about, there's DNA. Uh, homeostasis, chemical bonds. Cell membrane, here you go. This is where we are. Let me maximize this. Get a little bit bigger. Okay. So we already know this. This is the nucleus. It has a nuclear membrane. It has, you could see the integral proteins that make channels. And the nucleolus has the compact DNA, right? It's tightly wound. This is the storage form. And the loosely, looser, right? It's still condensed. It's looser DNA is called chromatin, okay? And he goes, uh, this has to be replicated and duplicated. So we'll talk about that momentarily. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the DNA. And there are double blonde, blondes, uh, bonds. There are double bonds that are connecting all of these base pairs. These are base pairs, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. I'm gonna show you what they look like in a minute. And they're connected together with uh, double and triple hydrogen bonds. And then because it's double and triple, it kind of forms this uh, um, DNA helix or winding staircase. And then it winds around, wraps around these proteins called histones, right? And then makes a nucleosome. And then those wrap around and wrap around even more. Then, then that's the, it's still compact, but it's looser. But the more dense it is, of course, chromosomes. And you have 46, 23 from mommy, 23 from daddy. Okay. Now, DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid is made out of three things. It's made out of a sugar phosphate backbone, a base, which is adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. Here are these right here, A, T, G, C for short, and 
uh, you could see how adenine and thymine always connect to each other to two hydrogen bonds. Adenine will always match to thymine. Thymine will always match to adenine. That's a rule. Then you have guanine here and cytosine. Guanine will always match the cytosine. Let me make this a little bit bigger. Guanine will always match the cytosine through three hydrogen bonds. And cytosine will always match the guanine. And you could see here, it makes a staircase. Now the rungs on this staircase are made out of the nitrogenous bases. And there, see, they got nitrogens. And these are bases. And you have a sugar phosphate uh, backbone. You see, they're connected to the phosphates here, right? And these little hexagons, those are uh, ribose or uh, five carbon sugars. How do I know the five carbon? One, two, three, four, five points on a pentagon. That's five carbons. So I could ask you, what is DNA made out of? Is it A, sugar phosphate, B, base, C, hydrogen bond, D, all of the above. Isn't that an all of the above question? What forms the, the rungs or the backbone of the sugar? What sugar? Ribose, right? And they go in a certain direction because um, this is the fifth, this phosphate group connects on the fifth carbon, right? And um, so they call it five prime. And then this direction is five prime to three prime and the other, and just know that the other side goes, as you can see here, it's upside down. See how the oxygen is right side up? So that's five prime to three prime going down this way. And this way is three prime to five prime. And the, the three prime uh, connotes the, the third carbon and the five prime connotes the fifth carbon. Uh, that's some, um, what do you call it? Organic chemistry terminology. But just know that one side goes in one direction and the other side goes in another direction. And that makes this, this light blue thing, the backbone, the sugar phosphate backbone. And here's another example of a nitrogen space, which is of course made up of a sugar, a phosphate group, and of course the nitrogenous bases and your choices of nitrogenous bases for DNA are adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. AT always matches to each other with two hydrogen bonds. GC always match each other with three hydrogen bonds. Now think about my lecture right now, right? Not the most exciting thing in the world, but did you notice how many times I repeated certain things? Hint, hint. It's screaming one. It's going to be on an exam. And it's something important. Because just imagine if my hydrogen bonds weren't working, weren't working right, then don't you think I could have a problem with my genes, a problem with my horm um, um, hormones. Uh, um, I was about to say homolog base pairs. Well, you guys don't know what that is yet, but I'll tell you in a moment. So if there's something wrong with me chemically at the level of the DNA, don't you think replication is gonna get messed up? Sure. Don't you think, um, uh, what do you call that? Uh, the cells are gonna be messed up? If the cell's messed up, then the organ. If the organ's messed up, systems. System, that means my patient's sick. So if you look at it on the grand scale of things, I'm trying to find the lesson because there's a lovely video here that it's much better uh, than, my, than my lecture. So I'm gonna play uh, pieces of the video and I'm gonna pause it periodically in the same manner as you would if you were studying. Because if you're studying, don't watch the don't watch the video from front to back straight. You just you you're just gonna get uh, maybe your hand will get cramped by trying to write notes. Watch it in little sections and then digest those little parts. Write little notes and then ask yourself once you write the notes, is it important? Does it add to a potential uh, not only question for this class but for future classes? Let's play this. It's just beautiful, isn't it? It's, it's just, it's, it's mesmerizing. It's, it's double helix sighting. You really can tell just by looking at it how sort of important and amazing it is. It's pretty much the most complicated molecule that exists and potentially 
the most important one. It's so complex that we didn't even know for sure what it looked like until about 60 years ago. It's so multifariously awesome that if you took all of it from just one of our cells and untangled it, it would be taller than me. Now consider that there are probably 50 trillion cells in my body right now. Laid end to end, the DNA in those cells would stretch to the sun not once, but 600 times. Mind blown yet? Hey, you wanna make one? Of course you know, I'm talking about deoxyribonucleic acid, known to its friends as DNA. DNA is what stores our genetic instructions, the information that programs all of our cells' activities. It's a six billion letter code that provides the assembly instructions for everything that you are. And it does the same thing for pretty much every other living thing. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and assume that you are a human, in which case every body cell that you have, or somatic cell, in you has 46 chromosomes, each containing one big DNA molecule. These chromosomes are packed together tightly with proteins in the nucleus of the cell. DNA is nucleic acid, and so is its cousin, which we'll also be talking about, ribonucleic acid, or RNA. Now, if you can uh, make your mind do this, remember all the way back to episode three, where we talked about all of the important biological molecules, carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. That ring a bell? Well, nucleic acids are the fourth major group of biological molecules, and for my money, they have the most complicated job of all. Structurally, they're polymers, which means that each one is made up of many small repeating molecular units. In DNA, these small units are called nucleotides. Link them together and you have yourself a polynucleotide. Now, before we actually put these tiny parts together to build a DNA molecule, like some microscopic piece of IKEA furniture, let's first take a look at what makes up each nucleotide. We're gonna need three things. One, a five carbon sugar molecule. Boom, right there. When, when a textbook, a professor, or a video starts listing things, that's already, doesn't this scream? Uh, goes, uh, what is DNA made out of? Five carbon sugar, A, phosphate group, B, uh, nitrogenous base, C, D, all of the above, E, none of the above. It's already screaming a question. So when you see a list of things like that, and uh, start thinking that, hey, that's something important. They're breaking down, and isn't this the anatomy of DNA? Hence the, the title of this course. Two, a phosphate group, and three, one of four nitrogen bases. DNA gets the first part of its name from our first ingredient, the sugar molecule, which is called deoxyribose. But all the really significant stuff, the genetic coding that makes you you, is found among the four nitrogenous bases, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. It's important to note that in living organisms, DNA doesn't exist as a single polynucleotide molecule, but rather a pair of molecules that are held tightly together. They're like an intertwined microscopic double spiral staircase. Basically, just a ladder, but twisted. The famous double helix. And like any good structure, we have to have a main support. In DNA, the sugars and phosphates bond together to form twin backbones. These sugar phosphate bonds run down each side of the helix, but chemically in opposite directions. In other words, if you look at each of the sugar phosphate backbones, you'll see that one appears to be upside down in relation to the other. One strand begins at the top of the first phosphate, connected to the sugar molecule's fifth carbon, and then ending where the next phosphate would go, with a free end at the sugar's third Third carbon. This creates a pattern called five prime and three prime. I've always thought the deoxyribose with an arrow with the oxygen as a point. It always points from three prime to five prime. Now on the other strand, it's exactly the opposite. It begins up top with a free end at the sugar's third carbon, and then the phosphates connect to the sugar's fifth carbons all the way down. And then now this direction is important because one direction is moving one way, and we'll see in a moment uh, that. It, it causes complications. At the bottom with the phosphate, and you've probably figured this out already, but this is called the three prime to five prime direction. Now it is time to make ourselves one of these famous double helices. These two long chains are linked together by the nitrogenous bases via relatively weak hydrogen bonds, but they can't be just any pair of nitrogenous bases. Thankfully, when it comes to figuring out what part goes where, all you have to do is remember that if one nucleotide has an adenine base, only thymine can be its counterpart. Likewise, guanine can only bond with cytosine. These 
bonded nitrogenous bases are called base pairs. The GC pairing has three hydrogen bonds, making it slightly stronger than the AT base pair, which only has two. It's the order of these four nucleobases, or the base sequence, that allows your DNA to create you. So A, G, G, T, C, C, A, T, G means something completely different as a base sequence than, say, T, T, C, A, G, T, C, G. Human chromosome 1, the largest of all of our chromosomes, contains a single molecule of DNA with 247 million base pairs. If you printed all of the letters of chromosome 1 into a book, it would be about 200,000 pages long. And each of your somatic cells has 46 DNA molecules tightly packed into its nucleus. That's one for each of your chromosomes. Put all 46 molecules together and we're talking about roughly 6 billion base pairs in every cell. This is the longest book that I've ever read. It's about a thousand pages long. If we were to fill it with our DNA sequence, we'd need about 10,000 of them to fit our entire genome. Pop quiz! Let's test your skills using a very short strand of DNA. I'll give you one base sequence, you give me the base sequence that appears on the other strand. Okay, here goes. So we got a five prime. Okay, let's stop this. And this is a classic question. Uh, let me write it down and then so five prime to three prime, A, G, G, T, what, C, C, G? Okay. Let's pause this for a second. Here's a classic question that's NCLEX, MCAT, uh, any uh, horrific alphabet soup exam you have to take in your near future. The classic question would be this. Um, Given the following sequence, find its base pair. So the sequence would be five prime, and it's uh, A, G, G, T, C, C, G, three prime. Now, right off the bat, I could even ask you, what is that? If I wrote it like this, you'd immediately tell me, oh, that's DNA. Oh, how do I know? Well, five prime to three prime, and they're asking me for a pair, right? And I recognize A, G, T, C, that's adenine, guanine, thiamine, thiamine, cytosine. Okay, but now I'm asked to find its pair. In order to do that, you know that the other side is gonna go the opposite direction. So you're going to, this side starts at five prime, so this side, has to start at three prime. What does A match to? A will always match to T. Well, that's thymine. Guanine, G, will always match to C. Okay. Thymine will always match to adenine. All right. Cytosine will always match to guanine. Mm, I know that. Guanine will always match to cytosine. And then, since this started at three prime, it has to end at five prime. So the trick is to figure it out yourself, because if I have this, then I'll do all, all these crazy things. Like, I'll be like five, and then three, and then, you know, there'll be all these choices. So the best thing to figure out is just figure it out because one side is going one way, the other side is going the other way. Adenine always matches to thymine. Guanine always matches to cytosine. Thymine always matches to adenine. And uh, what else? So it's always AT always matches to each other and GC and in a multitude of combinations. And just with those four combinations and with the, that order, it can make a code that can tell your body to do a multitude of things. Everything from like, uh, you know, roll your tongue to something really important like memory. Okay. Um, which, by the way, uh, oh, well, I'm not going to get into that. Uh, I'm, I'm digressing. So does anyone have a question on how this kind of question could pop out on the exam and how to answer it? I could also break this question up. Uh, and like, uh, I could ask, what is this? And you'll tell me it's DNA. Uh, I could, um, I could also ask, 
what's adenine? What's guanine? What does adenine pair with? What does guanine pair with? Because what does thymine pair with? What does cytosine pair with? It, it gives a multitude of questions just by knowing and understanding uh, uh, base pairs. All right, so if no one has any questions, let's move on. AGG to CCG to three prime and time's up. The answer is three prime TCC AGGC. Right, so you could see that the adenine prime, everything matched up, but in the opposite direction. Sorry, I'm, I'm obscuring that. Five prime. See how that works? It's not super complicated. Since each nitrogenous base only has one counterpart, you can use one base sequence to predict what its matching sequence is going to look like. So, could I make the same base sequence with a strand of that other nucleic acid, RNA? No, you could not. RNA is certainly similar to its cousin. All right. Now, now that we know what DNA is, DNA is double stranded. It has adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. RNA is very different. So don't you think that would be, once this is another signal for you to start, oh, this is important. Anytime in your textbook or your lecture or a video that there's a comparison. And of course, we already been talking about DNA, it's the blueprint of who you are. The RNA is the uh, transcription and translation of that blueprint so that your cell can make proteins so that your cell can understand what the code means. So in a way, DNA is the blueprint of who you are. RNA is kind of like a foreman who um, gets those blueprints out to the, you know, to the workers so that they know what they're doing, right? You know, you know the architect speaks their language, but the foreman speaks a very different language to you know, uh, the construction worker that's building the building. And that, that's, the, that's kind of the analogy that I always uh, kind of looked at. So this is now the presentation of what's different, what makes RNA different. DNA, it has a sugar phosphate backbone with nucleotide bases attached to it, but there are three major differences. One, RNA is a single-stranded molecule, no double helix here. Two, the sugar in RNA is ribose, which has one more oxygen atom than deoxyribose, hence the whole starting with an R instead of a D thing. And finally, RNA does not contain thymine. Its fourth nucleotide is the base uracil, so it bonds with adenine instead. RNA- Oops, let's go back. So doesn't that scream? oxygen atom than deoxyribose, hence the whole starting with an R instead of a D thing. And finally, RNA does not- so there are three major differences. Those, there's one more oxygen on its ribose, okay? Hence the term ribonucleic acid, RNA. It goes, there's no, it goes, there's only a single strand and it has uracil instead of thymine. Doesn't that look like a beautiful all of the above question? Or can I have a picture of RNA on one side, a picture of DNA on the other? And I could ask you, which one's which? And you could tell me if one of them had, if one of them is single stranded, it has a U in it, then you already know that's RNA, right? And that's the, that's kind of like the messenger or the foreman, right? And the DNA, the double stranded, right? That has thymine and not uracil, that's the blueprint. Contain thymine. Its fourth nucleotide is the base uracil, so it bonds with adenine instead. RNA is super important to the production of our proteins, and you'll see later that it has a crucial role in the replication of DNA. But first... All right, let's skip this part because it's about... It's uh, uh, about these other people, Mishler and Franklin. We already know that Watson and Crick originally um, got the Nobel Prize and also got the credit for discovering the double helix pattern of DNA. But then what did I, that's why I'm, we're trying to uh, train you guys to cite your work because there are other people like Franklin here, they, Watson and Crick based their entire work off of her stuff. And, you know, it was, uh, I forgot, what was it the um, 1800s and, or early 1900s? <coughs> She's a woman in science, so no one gave, gave a darn about her. So they just pretty much plagiarized their work and took credit and took the fame and took the money, took everything. And meanwhile, uh, Franklin died of cancer uh, because uh, at the time, her and Marie Curie, 
they didn't know that uh, messing around with um, radioactive material gave you cancer. And that was like more than 100 years ago. So, you know, can't really blame them. But uh, it's only now in the history books that we're the, they're realizing that, oops, uh, that's why I always question your history. Like, for example, um, Christopher Columbus. When I was a kid, oh, Christopher Columbus Day. It's like he's the greatest guy in the world. Then you read what he really did. Um, how he enslaved the indigenous people, how, uh, you know, uh, the, the rape and the, all the horrifying things in history. Real history is never, never clean. It is never, uh, it is never nice. And that's why in uh, medical history, we like to document everything. So we know, uh, um, so we know exactly how things go down so that in the future, don't make the same mistakes and also know where you get things because it's it, it's just simply not right and it's and it at least you know she's getting some credit at least all right now how do we build goes how do we do uh, uh replicate this how do i take that dna i gotta open it up copy it get a good copy uh out of the nucleus so that the rest of my cell can have instructions so they can make proteins to give, uh, you know, to, to do work. So a heart cell can be a heart cell and a skin cell can be a skin cell. How, does, how do we do that? Copy it and will copy itself trillions of times. That's called replication. Of lifetime, each time using half of the original DNA strand as a template to build a new molecule. So how is a teenage boy like the enzyme helicase? Ugh, bad jokes. They both want to unzip your jeans. Helicase is marvelous. Okay. Unwinding the double helix at breakneck speed, slicing open those. So first things first. What does the suffix ASE mean? Those of you who got an A in medical terminology. ASE, so lipase, proteinase, helicase. What, uh, uh, what does it mean? What kind of chemical is uh, this helicase? Enzyme. It's an enzyme, yes. And what is the function of an enzyme? What do they typically do? Like lipase. What, is, uh, what, is, what does lipase do to lipids? Uh, basically break down. Yeah, thank you, sir. Break down. So there's a whole bunch of enzymes, but for our purposes, remember, Yes, they do break down things, but the major thing that the enzymes do is lower the activation energy of a particular um, 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 chemical reaction so that something can go down. And most of the time, enzymes is usually some sort of metabolism, some sort of breakdown uh, thing. So as we can see here, how do I know that it's DNA? Well, it's double-stranded. I have ATGC. Okay, I got cytosine. I got thiamine, right? So I know it's DNA, right? I have one direction going here, another direction going here. See how the oxygens are facing a different direction? So I have this thing. The first thing that has to happen is helicase. It takes the helix and then it unzips it. It breaks it down. And what does it break? Those, um, uh, those hydrogen bonds, because they're easy to break. And that's what helicase does. Um, and you're gonna be bumping into um, a set of three or four uh, enzymes uh, during the next five minutes. So doesn't that look like a beautiful, what's the enzyme, what's its function? Hence a physiology question, hint, hint. Lose hydrogen bonds between the base pairs. The point where the splitting starts is known as the replication fork. It has a top strand called the leading strand or the good guy strand as I call it. Another bottom strand called the lagging strand, which I like to call the scumbag strand because it is a pain in the butt to deal with. These unwound sections can now be used as templates to create two complementary DNA strands, but remember the two strands go in opposite directions in terms of their chemical structure, which means that making a new DNA strand for the leading strand is going to be much, much easier than for the lagging strand. For the leading good guy strand, an enzyme called DNA polymerase just adds matching nucleotides onto the main stem all the way down the molecule. But before it could do that, it needs a selection of nucleotides that fill in the section that's just been unzipped. To get started at the very beginning of the DNA molecule, DNA polymerase needs a bit of a primer, just a little thing for it to hook onto so that it can start building the new DNA chain. And for that little primer. Okay, so everything he just said, 
DNA primase, right, comes in. We can thank the enzyme. I mean, RNA primase. Now, why RNA? Because RNA is single strand. So the single strand can then do what? Primer. What happens when you prime something? You begin it. So you have RNA primase, and it's perfect because it's single stranded, and it can match up to this open, uh, open single strand DNA. Now, this is called the leading strand because um, uh, these enzymes like going in this direction. Now, he called the lagging strand the scumbag strand. It's called lagging because when someone's lagging, that means it takes more time. It's, I don't know why I call it scumbag strand. It seems a little harsh. But lagging means it's just going to take a little bit longer for this strand that's down here. RNA primase. Now, how do I know it's RNA? You know, A typically matches with T for, for um, DNA. But how do I know it's RNA? This single stranded, and then you got that extra oxygen that's right here, right? Oh, look at this. Instead of T, it's a U, right? So the A will match to a U. So do you think I could have a picture of this? And then I ask you, what's this? What's this? You'll tell me this is a single stranded part of DNA. And you'll tell me, what's this? This is a single stranded uh, piece of RNA that's complementing this DNA. And it's at the beginning. Uh, of this unzipped DNA, that means this has to be RNA primase. Primer, prime means what? First, beginning. Strand only needs this RNA primer once at the very beginning, then DNA polymerase is all, I got this, and it just follows the unzipping. At now, DNA poly, right? It's DNA, and you could see, I know, because look, that's, that's, uh, uh, that's the deoxyribose. It doesn't have that sugar that extra oxygen. And instead of uracil, I can now have again, A will match with T. And it's poly. Poly in medical terminology means many. So the DNA polymerase will make many and it will go nice and easy on this leading strand. So it starts with RNA primase, then go to DNA polymerase, and then copies all of that. New nucleotides the chain continuously all the way down the molecule. Copying the lagging or scumbag strand is, well, it's a freaking scumbag. This is because DNA polymerase can only copy strands in the five prime, three prime direction, and the lagging strand is three prime, five prime. So DNA polymerase can only add new nucleotides to the three, three prime end of a primer. So maybe the real scumbag here is the DNA polymerase. Since the lagging strand runs in the opposite direction, it has to be copied in a series of segments. And here that awesome little enzyme, RNA primase, does its thing again. So the weird thing about the lagging strand is the RNA primase can only go in the uh, five prime to three prime direction, which is backwards here on the lagging strand. So it like kind of hops in the middle and then does, uh, uh, you know, and does its, uh, you know, uh, four base pairs. And then uh, poly can then finish up the, whatever is the rest, right? And then the RNA poly, poly will jump here and then do that. And then the, um, then the RNA, and then the DNA poly can finish up the rest. So it kind of like, like leapfrogs and it takes a little while longer. And these little parts, um, he's gonna tell you in a minute, they're called Okazaki fragments laying down an occasional short little RNA primer that gives the DNA polymerase a starting point to then work backwards along the strand. This is done in a ton of individual segments, each 1,000 to 2,000 base pairs long, each starting with an RNA primer. These are called Okazaki fragments. After the couple of married scientists who discovered this step in the process in the 1960s, and thank goodness they were married so that we could just call them Okazaki fragments instead of Okazaki hyphen someone's hyphen someone fragments. These allow the strands to be synthesized in short bursts, and then another kind of DNA polymerase has to go back over and replace all of those RNA primers, and then the little fragments gets joined up by a final enzyme called. Now, so. Not only they have primase, not only do they have uh, DNA polymerase, someone's got to marry all the Okazaki fragments. And that's ligase, right? A ligand is like a, like, a, like a string that's sticking out, right? So someone's got to like glue all the fragments together because they're a fragment and you got to make one big, uh, uh, one big DNA chain and that's DNA ligase. So, uh, I could ask you about the lagging strand versus the leading strand. 
there is no, uh, um, uh, there's a different set of rules and terms for the lagging strand than for the leading strand. Again, hint, hint, isn't that a comparison? If there's a comparison, especially with anatomy or in this case, physiology, how exactly does this, does this in your body? Now this should amaze you. This is happening every millisecond, even before you were born. And you should be amazed that um, there are not that many errors because if you had errors, then you wouldn't live. Uh, the blueprint will, won't match up to make a human being. DNA ligase. And that is why I say that the lagging strand is such a scumbag. DNA replication gets it wrong about one in every 10 billion nucleotides. But don't think your body doesn't have an app for that. It turns out that DNA polymerases can also proofread, in a sense, removing nucleotides from the end of a strand. So, what does that mean? DNA poly has two functions. It not only elongates and makes more uh, uh, of the DNA chain, it also proofreads it all. Actually, there's more than one kind of DNA poly. I believe there's three, if I remember my cell molecular biology. And it proofreads it. And that's why you only get errors one in a billion. But if, there, if the errors persist, then you have genetic disease, disorder, then you got other problems. Um, uh, and um, what do you call that? And it's the basis of why we're studying this, these things. So the beauty of education, what I always thought is, this is really neat for, I don't know about you, but for me, um, I now know exactly how I was created. I also now know that if you know and understand what this is, you know how we're always finding fault with others or finding fault with ourselves. We're pretty perfect. One in a billion error per code. So, I don't know, we, we shouldn't be too harsh on ourselves. Uh, and, and also, this is highly complex and, and, and no matter whatever higher power you believe in, whatever religion you believe in, this, is, this has to be amazing. And if you don't find it amazing, uh, you're in the wrong business. Um, uh, and, and also, you won't understand how genetic diseases work. Uh, and this is amazing why we don't have even more genetic diseases. And now that we now know that 40% of learn, it goes of not learn, 40% of innate or inborn error, um, not error, but um, personality traits are embedded within the code. Don't you think psychiatry and psychology really want to know about this? And yes, they are. And we're now looking at more genetic features and, um, the, um, the genetic interview, especially in medicine, has been expanded uh, over the years since I went to school. So what's, uh, da, 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 what else do we have to do about genetics? Uh, I believe we went a little bit over um, last week when we discussed uh, uh, the genetic diseases and autosomal dominance and the recessiveness. So click on this Punnett square. Is it? No, it's not. Let me just sh let me show you what a Punnett square is. So what's a Punnett square? Remember we were talking about last week, we were talking about gen genetics and how we get one set from mommy, let's say this is mommy, one set from daddy, which is here. So you'll see it written like this. Now, just like uh, that chart that we saw before, um, that was an autosomal recessive disease. So if the one of the children has a homozygous recessive or the two lowercase a's, that means this, this child is gonna get it. And you could see how they matched it. They took um, um, uh, one letter and here and then put another letter here. So if this is mommy, this is capital A and a lowercase a, and this is daddy, capital A, lowercase a, and then they just match them up. So one from daddy, one from mommy. So that's capital A, capital A, homozygous dominant. It goes one from mommy, one from daddy, right? 
this will cross over here, a capital A, lowercase a, heterozygous, dominant, uh, one lowercase a from daddy, one, uh, one uppercase a from mommy, that matches to this, you know, kind of like a little genetic Sudoku here going. And then you have lowercase a, lowercase a here. So if you recall, one out of four or 25% are the odds that the child will get the full-blown disease. One child, 20 or one out of four, 25%, will be completely normal with no genetic carrier. And then two in autosomal recessive will be carriers. And that's this child here. And two out of four, that's 50%. And remember, phenotype is uh, the physical attributes or what comes out in the real world. And genotype are these, the letters that represent the phenotypes. So this is your typical Punnett square. And uh, there's this guy, I think uh, he's some priest who is messing around with peas, as in like, you know, uh, is, it, is it Gregor Mendel? I forgot. But you could see here, you know, how he set it up like that. You know, you, mom, I usually put the mom up top because cradle that rules the world, right? Uh, what is it? Uh, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. So he figured out like, and um, uh, you know, that if you cross things, especially with plants, here's an example. Like if I had one pea plant that was fully homozygous recessive, uh, uh, it would be yellow. And um, so if I matched up with a, uh, a green pea plant that had a, um, a, um, a lowercase g or a, in its genetics, that means it would be 50%. Two would be carriers, but they'd be colored green, and two would be outright just like yellow. So you could see how you could take one g from here, lowercase g from here, that goes together. This G and this G, that goes together for that. This lowercase G and this lowercase G, that goes for that. This lowercase G. So you can figure out basic percentages, okay? Just like uh, with this one, just like with this, you know, uh, just as a, uh, like as a, uh, um, like a, um, uh, a basis for, you know, how to try to predict uh, genetics. And here's a classic type. And here's something that I could also ask on exam, right? If I had both parents who are homozygous dominant, what are the odds the, uh, what are the, odds the child will have, uh, will be homozygous dominant? And in this case, it's 100%, right? What are the odds of the child having the full-blown disease in, in uh, uh, autosomal recessive? One, which are the world carriers? These two which is the one perfectly, absolutely normal with no carrier, this one. How about this? This mommy with this daddy. Well, two of them will be carriers, two of them will be normal. How about if mommy has a disease, daddy has the disease, they're both autosomal recessive. Boom, all kids are gonna have it. So this is a nice, uh, and it shows that the letters are the genotype and the phenotype is what will they look like? You know, and this is like a, a, a simpler, this is a simplification for height because uh, I learned because I was very, very interested in height. Why is the Garias family five foot 10, six one? Uh, uh, why am I five foot nothing? Well, I go and uh, the, um, the Celadonia family, my mother's family, why they're all midgets or what they call little people, sorry, right? Um, I actually call uh, I actually call some of my cousins hobbits because they're like five one, they're even shorter than me, right? But you know, joking, bad jokes aside, um, height is multifactorial. But here, let's say if height was based on a single genetic trait or a single genetic allele, right? You could figure out like if if let's say both parents are tall, right? But they have a recessive gene. That means One's definitely going to be tall. The other ones are going to be tall, but their kids may be short, but there's definitely one kid who's going to be short. And I'm that kid right here, right? I've always had a Napoleonic complex ever since I was a kid. Just how it is. Just how it is. 
You know how that song short people got no reason to. Yes, we do. We have every reason to be upset. All right. So we now know how the code gets copied. We also know how it reads the code. We also know how we control the code through um, DNA poly, which, uh, which proofreads it and makes sure that it's all on the up and up so that there's only one in one billion base pairs that's gonna be in error. And of course, we know how the differences of structures. Now, how do we replicate things? I mean, we already know how it replicates, but so what? It has to divide. And that's when we have this video right here, mitosis versus meiosis. And again, it's a comparison. So isn't it screaming, hey, this has to be a question on the exam. Tonight. Before we go in depth Whoa. on my. Just the volume. Mitosis, I wanna do a very high level overview comparing mitosis to meiosis. So in mitosis, and this is all a review if you've watched the mitosis video. In mitosis, we start with a cell. We start with a cell that has a diploid number of chromosomes. I'll just write 2n to show it has the diploid number. For human beings, this would be 46 chromosomes. 46 for, for 46 for humans. You get 23 chromosomes from your mother, 23 chromosomes from your father, or you could say you have 23 homologous pairs, which leads to 46 chromosomes. Now after the process of mitosis happens, and you have your cytokinesis and all the rest, you end up with two cells that each have the same genetic information as the original. So you now have two cells that each have the diploid number of chromosomes. So 2n and 2n. And now each of these cells are just like this cell was. It can go through, it can go through interphase again and it So my, mitosis is for somatic cells. You start off with a complete genetic material that gets doubled and then splits so that one, the daughter cells or the next generation of cells would be the same exact copy as the parent cell. And that happens in somatic cells. Like, so for example, if this is a skin cell, what do you get after mitosis? You get skin cells. If this is a heart cell, what do you get after mitosis? Heart cell, you get exact copies. And I could also ask that the beginning product of mitosis, you will tell me it is diploid, D-I-P-L-O-I-D, di, meaning two. 2N, right? Two sets of chromosomes, one from mommy, one from daddy. So this is a complete somatic cell, soma meaning body, human being. And what do you end up with? 2N chromosome, 2N all or 46 chromosomes complete, okay? Because this is an actual human being. Grows and it can it can it can replicate its DNA and its centrosomes and grow some more. And then each of these can go through mitosis again. And this is actually how your most of the cells in your body grow. This is how you turn from a single cell, cell organism into you, or for the most part, into you. So that is mitosis. And one way to think about it, it's a cycle. After each of these things go through mitosis, they can then go through they can then go through the entire cell cycle again. And let me write this a little bit neater mitosis, that S was a little bit hard to read. Now what happens in meiosis? What happens in meiosis? I'll do that over here. In meiosis, something slightly different happens. And it happens in two phases. So you will start with a, you st will start with a, with a cell that has a diploid number of chromosomes. So you will start with a cell that has a diploid number of chromosomes. And in its interphase, it also replicates its DNA. And then it goes through something called meiosis one. And in meiosis one, what you end up with is two cells that now have a haploid number of chromosomes. So you end up with two cells. You now have two cells that each have a haploid number of chromosomes. So you have N and you have N. So if we're talking about human beings, you have 46 chromosomes here, and now you have 23 chromosomes in this, in this nucleus, and now you have 23 
in this nucleus, but you're still not done. Then each of these will then go through a phase, which, which I'll talk about in a second, which is very similar to mitosis, which will, which will duplicate this entire cell into two. So actually, let me do it like this. So now, this one, you're going to have four. You're going to have four cells that each have the haploid number that each have the haploid number of chromosomes. And they all don't necessarily have the same genetic information anymore. Because as we go through this first phase right over here of meiosis, and this first phase where you go from diploid to haploid, right over here, this is called meiosis 1. Meiosis 1. You're essentially splitting the homologous pairs, and and so this one might get some of the homologous, some of the some of the ones that you originally got from your father, and some of the ones that you originally got from your mother, some of the ones that you originally got from your father, some of the ones that you originally got from your mother. They split randomly, but each homologous pairs, each homologous pair gets split up, and then in this phase, meiosis two, so this phase right over here is called meiosis two. It's very similar to mitosis, except you're now dealing with cells that start off with the haploid number. And it's important to realize meiosis is not a cycle. These cells that you have over here, these are gametes. These are sex cells. These are gametes. These can now be used in fertilization. If we're talking about if you're male, this is happening in your testes, and these are going to be sperm cells. If, the, if you are female, this is happening in your ovaries, and these are going to be egg cells. So you can now see how very different. The end product of meiosis is 1N, or haploid. H-A-P-L-O-I-D, haploid amount of chromosomes. So if this is in daddy, or the male counterpart, that's 23 chromosomes. And these would be gametes, sperm cells. If it is in uh, the female anatomy, it would be 23 chromosomes, or the ovum that gets released during ovulation. And there's only one that gets released. Uh, the most mature graphene follicle will get released. So isn't that a good question? In mitosis and meiosis, what do they start off with? Both of them start off with 2N, but meiosis only ends up with 1N. And there are two sets of division for meiosis versus mitosis, one set. Mitosis creates somatic cells with complete chromosomes. Meiosis it goes, uh, creates gametes or uh, sperm cell, male, ovum, in, uh, or egg in female. So, uh, and the neat part here is the genetics during the meiosis two phase has to get mixed up. Um, if you recall your biology, there's a term called biodiversity. It is the only way plants and animals get to live. It's also the reason why you can't marry your cousin and have children with your cousin because the genetics is too close. That's why there's a lot of genetic diseases with people who are in, you know, very close societies or in royalty, uh, you know, because royals only marry royals, you know, back in the day. And with very, a lot of close societies where um, the most studied is the Ashkenazi Jews uh, in Europe, because they're, ve they're very, very um, uh, tight packed group, but they keep on marrying, intermarrying with each in within each other. And then because because they won't give the perfect opportunity for all of these genetics to mix. That's why I never understood why human beings always try to look, uh, look for our differences. Like, oh, I can't be with that person because they're different. You should be with that person if you are different because they are different. Uh, because it's the only way the human species can, uh, can grow. And you can now see actual biological evidence that we human beings have to intermingle with each other because the genetics has to has to be all spread out the same also can be said about plants um any of you uh maybe come from a family of farmers you know you don't cook the you don't not cook you don't plant the same crop in the same field every season that's death that's a good way to get um, disease. It's a good way to uh, ruin the soil. Even though I'm a city kid, 
uh, um, both uh, my, my mom was a farmer's daughter uh, in the Philippines. My dad grew up in the jungle. So um, they made me like, I don't know, go to the woods a lot. Ah, I didn't appreciate it as a child and as an adult, I definitely don't appreciate it. But you can now see how, you know, put all geopolitic, uh, political topics aside. Just look at data, just look at hard facts. It is hard facts that um, uh, DNA needs to be mixed to, uh, you know, um, um, to ensure that our species and to make sure that, like, uh, uh, you know, when, uh, uh, like, Hitler got it all backwards. You know how he was saying that, oh, we're gonna make a master human race by only having like, you know, the Aryan race all in one. Someone didn't go to school, right? And it's what? It's more politics than what? Actual uh, biology and genetics. So comparing mitosis and meiosis, right? Know that definitely, it was a video, we went over it. So now let's look at, did we talk about the structure and function of DNA? Yep, sure. Did we talk about how DNA replicates? Yep. Did we discuss mitosis and meiosis? Yep. So uh, um, that could because uh, that is your concept map, and that's the only thing that's due for next week. It is at this portion of the show uh, where I stop the recording, and then I field any questions. If you have no